Well, hello, folks. Welcome to The Sacred Speaks. My name is John Price. I'm your host, and today is a celebration here at The Sacred Speaks. This marks 100 episodes. This is a project that's been going on for about five or six years. It has been one of the most expansive experiences of my life, and it continues to uh, reach its roots deeply into all the various areas of what is known and what is unknown and what is and what can be in, uh, in reality, which sounds broad and crazy, but also in my life. Um, this is a... Uh, I just want to thank you. I want to thank every single one of you who participates and checks this out and invests in this process. The material is obviously something that uh, has taken me into um, ecstatic states of joy and expansiveness continually. So thank you for participating. Thank you for being a part of this. There's more to come. I'm just getting started in a lot of ways. So I feel overjoyed with the celebratory attitude of, of 100. <laughs> and uh, and I, I couldn't have asked for a better participant today for this 100th episode than Dr. James Hollis. Um, Dr. Hollis was a professor of mine when I started my doctoral program at um, Saybrook, which is a program that Jim brought from Saybrook to Houston. So he, he, he was the professor of my first seminar, wherein we explored the Symbols of Transformation, Jung's fifth volume in his collected works. And again, I, I, the meaning of this connection with, with Jim, this process, I'm reading his books, uh, feels kind of full circle, but in a totally different place than and I started out in 2010 when I, when I started that process. So I'm, again, overjoyed. Thank you, Dr. Hollis, for participating, and thank you, listener and viewer, for uh, participating as well. I want to get to a couple of notes, and then we'll get started. The first thing I want to do is read, uh, read Jim's bio, and, um, and, then, and then talk a little bit about the Center for Healing Arts and Sciences. So James Hollis was born in Springfield, Illinois, and graduated from Manchester University in 62 and Drew University in 67. He taught humanities for 26 years in various colleges and universities before retraining as a Jungian analyst at the Jung Institute of Zurich, Switzerland, 1977 to 82. He's presently a licensed Jungian analyst in private practice in Washington, D.C. He served as executive director of the Jung Educational Center in Houston, Texas for many years, and now is a is executive director of the Houston, uh, the Young Society of Washington until 2019. Now he serves on the JSW Board of Directors. He's a retri retired senior training analyst for the Interregional Society of Young Analysts and was first director of training in the Philadelphia Young Institute and is vice president emeritus of the Philemon Foundation. Additionally, he is a professor of Jungian studies for Saybrook University of San Francisco, Houston. He lives with his wife, Jill, and an artist and retired therapist in D.C., Together they have three living children and eight grandchildren. He's written a total of 18 books, which I think is more now, which have been translated into Swedish, Russian, German, Spanish, French, Hungarian, Portuguese, Turkish, Italian, Korean, Finnish, Romanian, Bulgarian, Farsi, Japanese, Greek, Chinese, Serbian, Latvian, Ukrainian, and Czech. Uh, that uh, certainly buoys up his, his position in the Jungian and academic territory. Jim, again, thanks for what you do. I tend to recommend your book to all the folks that I work with, or your books to all the folks I work with. So thanks for contributing to this uh, wild experience of the inner world, of religion, of depth psychology, of personal inquiry, and personal responsibility. Uh, the summons of our life, as, as Jim would, would say it. And so on that note, I want to mention the center. And I just want to give you a little bit of background on the center and what we are up to. Um, so the center, we believe in, a power of, in the power of integrative care. Our team of therapists, acupuncturists, herbalists, and holistic health coaches work together to address your well-being from multiple angles. I should also include, include analysts. We have two, uh, one training Jungian analyst and one Jungian analyst in the community at the center. Uh, whether it's navigating the intricacies of your mind, tuning into the wisdom of your body with acupuncture and herbal remedies, or shaping your lifestyle through coaching. We're here to support your unique journey toward wellness and also address the deep spiritual needs of our time, which uh, we're in a confusing space with religion, spirituality, with personal inquiry, uh, and try to understand our orientation because there's, there's something about our culture that really works and is so beautiful. And there's also um, part of it that needs some tending. And um, certainly religion is one of those areas. Many of our religions have become stale and unhooked from the original ecstatic experience, the alternate states that created the destabilizing conditions 
uh, upon which we queried and mined for years, trying to understand the depths of our existence and what we're actually doing here and what we're potentially, what our potential is and what we're capable of. So uh, check us out at the Center for Haas. The website's below, thecenterforhas.com. On that note, I'd like to bring in Modern Nations. Check out modernnationsmusic.com. Hang out to the end of the episode. You can hear their selection, Clouds, which is the theme song of the podcast. Uh, check out The Sacred Speaks at thesacredspeaks.com. Of course, check out Jim Hollis at jameshollis.net, J-A-M-E-S-H-O-L-L-I-S.net. And, uh, and remember to share, share this uh, project. Um, like it, comment, uh, engage. Uh, I really appreciate it, and um, I appreciate all the engagement that you all are doing so far. I'm going to keep it up. There's a lot more coming up. Uh, last thing to check out the uh, Instagram page where I'm going to be posting a lot of the updates and what's going on, including Eslin coming up. Um, and I think that's it. I think that's it. Thank you for being here. Thank you for celebrating. Big 100. For now, we'll leave it there. Dr. James Hollis, I, on a personal level, it's exciting to have you here. We've been having conversations like this for a long time now, and so for you to make the time to be here, I'm really honored. Thank you. You're welcome, John. Pleasure to be with you again. And I got to say, it gave me a really good reason to read um, The Broken Mirror in, in, a, in an intentional way. You know, I read a lot of your books, and there's always such depth and intentionality there. But I've really loved the opportunity to read the books that I read for the podcast. It just brings a new element to the intentionality. So this book was, I just, on so many levels, as a clinician, I was taken back to our our training when Sean Fitzpatrick and I used to sit at the tables and say, let's talk about clinical, I want to talk about how this applies clinically. And you sure did gift us with a lot of clinical insight in the in this book. So thank you for that. And I want to dive in in all kinds of different ways. But first, I want to start with this quote that I've heard a lot of times from, it's from Good Housekeeping. <laughs> and I want to dive into your understanding of soul. So I want to read this quote from Jung, and then we'll see where we go from there. All right. To this day, God is the name by which I designate all things which cross my willful path violently and recklessly. All things which upset my subjective views, plans, and intentions, and change the course of my life for better or worse. So when you think about soul and God, what comes to mind about why Jung would position God in this very different way than I certainly grew up with? Of course, uh, there's no big parent in the sky with a beard looking down and scrutinizing every action you take. It's, it's more about recognizing the relative position of the ego, which is to confront the magnitude of the mystery in which we swim at all times and to realize that we're not in charge here. And whenever you're radically obliged to sort of revision your sense of self and sense of world and sense of purpose, uh, perhaps coming out of trauma or whatever, uh, then you're in the presence of the mystery. I think what uh, Jung is really trying to do is preserve the autonomy of the gods, so to speak, the, the autonomy of the, the powers that run through the universe and run through us as well. And at the same time, to sort of re relativize and reposition the ego so that it's, it's in a receptive position to say, all right, the question in every new life situation is, is what is my task here in this situation over which perhaps I have very little external power? Mm -hmm. What are my psychological projects? What are my, my assignments, so to speak, here? How am I to conduct myself? And how do I face the fire here, which sometimes uh, we have to do? So uh, that particular letter, it's amusing that it was in Good Housekeeping to start with, was in response to um, a, a comment that Jung made in an interview for the BBC, which he regretted saying it was just a response where he was asked, do you believe in God? And he said, well, I don't believe I know. And 
tons of people around the world wrote to him and said, well, what did you experience? And what is your evidence? And so forth. And so he got sort of tired of responding to all these people, which is why he allowed this uh, this particular letter to be published uh, in, in a very large uh, medium. Mm-hmm. And uh, in that, again, what he's, he's saying here is um, wheresoever you are needing to completely reframe your sense of self and, and your relationship to the mystery of this life, um, then, then you are um, in relationship to the transcendent other, that over which we have uh, no powers, but to which we must always respond and in a proportionate way. So long-winded answer. No, be long-winded as you want, Jim. <laughs> um, so it brings up a question back to what Sean and I used to say. Let's talk clinically. And because you did, s- <laughs> I really appreciate this book. Um, you talked about the cure. And I, I, I want to frame this as having a conversation as we are, we provide therapy for people. And you you write about the misunderstandings of what therapy is and certainly the misunderstandings of our culture. And so I want to do it on a couple of levels. I want to look at some of the preconceived notions that people have about therapy in your analytic office, but then also some of the issues that we have in a quote, Western orientation. So if we can start with the individual level, just see where we go and free associate for a bit on that. Well, maybe it would be appropriate for you, John, to summarize what you think are some of the attitudes that we have in our culture. Um, <laughs> Of course, most therapy is problem-centered, and that's understandable. People call a plumber when they have a plumbing problem. So many times people will solicit a therapist when they need another point of view, another pair of eyes on a situation, and ask for direct advice on how to deal with something. How do I deal with my rebellious teenager? How do I deal with this depression? How do I you know, deal with my fears about applying for a new career, et cetera? And that's important life stuff. And short-term therapy can be extremely helpful in helping us sort of, again, reframe our situation and look at it from a different perspective. But the long-term issue of what we call analysis or psychodynamic psychology is really addressing the developmental tasks of the person and to always to, to address what undergrids most of our suffering, which is a disconnect from meaning. If, we, if we're living in a meaningful relationship to whatever our life circumstance is at the moment, we can sort of tolerate everything. We can get mm-hmm. through things. We can we can do the things that we don't want to do, but we, we have a sense of um, a, a larger purchase on what it really is about. And that allows us to endure whatever needs to be endured. There's a famous letter that Jung wrote to... Um, lady in the 1950s in which he said this work uh, requires three parts of which psychology can only address the first part which is to give insight into why something might be happening in our life and how to look at it perhaps but secondly and thirdly he said come the moral qualities of the individual and and that's the term he used moral qualities Uh, second is courage to face whatever needs to be faced and the third is uh, endurance, sticking it out over time. And when one does that, then one finds oneself, um, you know, recovering a sense of personal authority, you know, finding your pathway through the thicket of choices that you face, finding the threads and the, tas- the tapestry of your life that you need to really hang on to, as opposed to the ones that need to be left behind. So that discernment process ultimately leads one to the necessity of choice and, and choice is often difficult. And many times people come to therapy because they don't feel they have choices or their choices are owned by their complexes. And once you have a larger perspective, that's one of the reasons we pay attention to dreams, for example. It's not indulging in fantasy. It's looking at our lives from a perspective that's transcendent to ordinary ego consciousness. So the psyche has a way of seeing and understanding the larger things that are healthful for us or harmful for us in a way where the ego might be just driven by a complex or be intimidated by uh, dealing with whatever must be confronted. So uh, again, when we have a sense of purposefulness or a sense of meaning, 
then we can work our way through these very difficult circumstances. But no set of behavioral changes or 30, 30 days to this or that or five steps will take us to a place where we have that sense of uh, harmony with our inner life. You know, you can indulge and engage in all kinds of conflict and all kinds of suffering. As I think you know, my last two years have been spent significantly in the medical world. And there was even some uncertainty about whether I would be here to be part of this interview. Yeah. And so certainly Jung's definition of divinity passed before my mind many times. And that, that was, again, to acknowledge that which radically crosses my path and alters the conscious intention of my life for good or for ill. And then out of that new arena, one still has choices to make. And what are your choices going to be and in service to what? I've often said one of the central questions to ask is not so much what do you do, but what is that in service to inside of you? Mm -hmm. Different matter. It could be an old, old fear-based response. It could be a codependence. It, it could be trying to fit in a thousand things, a thousand motives that are not in the long run in our interests but have such reflexive power that we're often their servant without even knowing that they form really a shadow government operative within our lives. Well, you, I really appreciate your self-disclosure in this book. And as you, as you talk about where you are in life and what's been happening, I am curious how your confrontation with these last stages of life have enhanced or altered what you've been talking about for so many years regarding the soul in our religious life? Well, interestingly enough, um, I have found myself valuing my work even more than I did before, and I certainly valued it before, uh, which I think for me was not simply falling back on that which I knew, but was rather sort of rediscovering the power of the kind of deep in conversation that each of us needs to have around the meaning of this journey that we call our lives. We're not ultimately in charge. As um, Stanley Kunis, the poet, said once, I only borrow this dust. Well, <laughs> there comes a time when you have to return the loan, you know. Hmm. And I suspect, although one never knows, I'm closer to the uh, return date than, than, than you, John. I hope that's the case. But underneath all of this is, again, we swim in mystery. Um, and, and therefore, questions like, what is my vocation? Which is quite a different story than, what is my job? How do I pay my bills? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can bring together job and vocation, as you know. Uh, you've managed to do it. I've managed to do it. But mm -hmm. most folks don't. And therefore, there's something in them that often is neglected and suffers, and they know not the source from which that suffering emerges. So underneath all of that, once again, is the question, what does the soul want? And again, the soul is simply a metaphor for that part of you that is, um, you know, linked to whatever the central mysteries are of the universe. Uh, when, when you're born somehow that, energetic process enters this physical form called the body and it undergoes all kinds of changes but there's also a constancy in that process the infant you were is still present in the adult that you are um, and for all of the other changes that your life has gone through there's there's still a principle that abides at the end of his life Jung was uh, around 83 84 85 my, my age, I'm 83 at the moment, um, dictating his memoir. And if anyone had an opportunity for a grand summation, it would be Jung, but I was always impressed with his modesty. He said, at the end, I have no grand pronouncements to make. However, mm -hmm. I can attest that from the beginning, there's been a principle of continuity within me from which I've tried not to stray. And secondly, um, some energy has sustained me and driven me through uh, this life in a purposeful way. And, you know, when you get right down to it, that's really about all you can say, if you can say that. Most people would say, well, I never really felt that link mm -hmm. to my own internal unity. I never really felt that sense of linkage to that which is larger than I am. 
uh, I was always worried about the kids or I was always trying to pay the bills or was caught in this or that. And and that's certainly true. But I think what, what Jung's modesty was saying there was, you know, the mystery remains the mystery. Anything this poor little brain or imagination can encapsulate is going to be limited by this instrument. Yeah. Um, that's a fact of life. So I, I have to constantly be revising my image of the mystery and my encounters with the mystery. Uh, as the sages often said, the God that can be named is no longer God. It's become an artifact of consciousness, become a, a, a noun, so to speak, rather than a verb, which is a process of energy transformation. So uh, I've written quite a bit about the gods and asked where, where the gods disappeared. To, to you know when when they left Olympus and this was a question raised by Jung as a matter of fact a century ago he said where'd the gods go when they left Olympus and he said well they they left Olympus but they entered the solar plexus of the modern and, and their neglect produces our disorders so both social pathologies but but also individual uh, psychopathies as well so um, wherever those energies are neglected, there will be a price to pay. That's what nature keeps telling us over and over and over and over. Well, I want to read from you on that note, because what comes to mind is the intention. Um, I have I have two thoughts about, uh, well, a couple of things, but I, I actually wish, and I intend to read this to most of the people I work with, if not have it on my wall somewhere. You say... Uh, full professional disclosure would oblige the therapist to inform all new clients of the following realities. First, you will have to deal with this core issue for the rest of your life, and at best you will manage to win a few skirmishes in your long, uncivil war with yourself. Decades from now, you'll be fighting, these fam you'll be fighting on these familiar fronts, though the terrain may have shifted so much that you have difficulty recognizing the same old, same old. Second, you will be obliged to disassemble the many forces you have gathered to defend against your wound, at this late date, it is your defenses, not the wound, that cause the problem and arrest your journey. But removing those defenses will oblige you to feel all the discomfort of that wound again. And third, you will not be spared pain, vouchsafed wisdom, or granted exception, exemption from future suffering. That sure makes things sound attractive, doesn't it? It <laughs> Sean, Sean said it when he read those paragraphs when they first came out, uh, almost 20 years ago, I think. Um, well, that'll end self, self-help books forever. Yeah. <laughs> There's a certain truth to that because the core issues of one's life, one's sense of permission to be who you are, how you manage fear or fear manages you, your, your capacity to feel the inherent legitimacy of your desires, to feel that something within you is going to rise and support you when life mm -hmm. gets difficult. The, the, these are things that never go away. They are, they are companion issues throughout the course of our life, and we can make some progress toward them for sure. But there are certainly times when we get thrown for a loop and we're back in the same old, same old. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not being exempt from the human condition. It's learning mm -hmm. to live with it with a different set of attitudes and practices in order to find the position that's germane to you in this situation. And, uh, you know, to, in other words, sometimes life gets so murky and so difficult, we have no idea what the next step would be. And all you can reasonably say is, well, do the next best thing as you see it at the moment mm -hmm. and hang in there until life begins to open for you and you see, you know, the pathway that's appropriate for you. But, but that's not enough. Then comes the courage to undertake that pathway, and thirdly, the persistence to uh, carry it out and make a difference in your life, and maybe in the life of your relationships or, or your career or something else like that. So the human ego is tasked with, you know, the, the attendance to the life's daily tasks, such as everything from look both ways before you cross the street to uh, paying your bills. Mm -hmm. But it's not really the boss. It's it's an executive um, committee, but the larger service of the corporation, so to speak, is is the organism and its health and well being. So, you know, what, what, the ego also has to report to the to the board frequently, and and ultimately the board has the power. 
um, in terms of dictating the, uh, you know, well-being or lack thereof of the organism. So uh, the, the ego has to figure out a position where it's open, flexible, and willing to be instructed, but also accountable for behaviors mm -hmm. and actions in life. And uh, that's a shifting balance uh, throughout the course of one's life. Well, I want to take this from the the other thought that I was having earlier is this is to move into the collective level on a kind of a religious level. And this practice of not uttering the word Yahweh in the early Jewish religious process and the difference between that ritual and orientation and the one in which there's a divine being who incarnates in the form of a person and this Christian theology. And I'm, I'm wondering about that kind of theological form influencing how we relate to the gods and how we encounter these powers that you've written extensively about, but certainly in tracking the gods. So could you comment on that, that kind of how our theology impacts our psychology? Well, there was an old saying by Xenophon, a Greek historian, if um, horses and lions could draw, the gods they would draw would be horses and lions. So the truth is, gods don't make theology. Humans do. Gods don't make institutions. Humans do. Um, humans respond to the mystery embodied in the gods and out of that formulate ideas and formulate uh, structures meant to link to and to, tra to um, transfer, to perpetuate those linkages to the mystery. But in so doing, that they naturally carry the uh, imprint, if you will, of the psychology of those folks who were doing the formulation along the way. Mm -hmm. People have life experiences, but they interpret them in different ways. And you would say, well, which one of them is right? Well, they all had a subjective experience and it was real for them. And so we want to honor that reality without necessarily saying, well, that person's reality and understanding and interpretation of that therefore dictates to me. I have to, you know, examine my my own structures of experience and what ideas and, and what values rise from that. So, um, you know, <laughs> that's why someone like Kierkegaard said that the crowd is untruth. You can't help but have institutions. You can't help but have collective experiences. But he said, the larger the group, you know, the more likely it is to err. Uh, Jung said, the bigger the group, the lower the level of its consciousness. And that says mm -hmm. a lot about international foreign affairs and policy mm -hmm. decisions at the highest level, of course. So uh, I, I think we have to recognize, one, respect for the process, but also some skepticism about our subjective inference. The, the way I would put it in a quite a different way, and I, and I talk about this in The Broken Mirror, as late as 1800, a thoughtful and modest person could say, more or less, I know who I am, I'm making proper decisions here, and I know the factors that are playing out as I make my decisions. I, I know the other members of the corporate board table, intrapsychic. Um, well, after the work of Hume in Scotland and Kant in, in uh, uh, Prussia, uh, where they cast significant doubt upon our capacity to understand the objective world, and they said, whatever the objective world may be, we experience it subjective and mm -hmm. therefore condition it uh, through not only our psychological history, but our physiological apparatus, our cultural frame of reference, and, and, and so forth. So um, in, in doing that, what we have to recognize is that we're frequently responding to our subjective um, lens through which we see the world. Or as Kant put it very succinctly, uh, if you wear blue spectacles, you'll, you'll, have, you'll see a blue world with blue choices. And, and that is often the case for any cultural form that has dominance and sovereignty, which is why it can be so easily threatened by dissident, dissident opinion and other points of view, but also renewed by the same, because the capacity of uh, the collective ego consciousness 
has to, from time to time, to be challenged in order for renewal and mm -hmm. for evolution to occur. But talk is cheap. At the time, there's often an enormous amount of resistance that goes on. When you're sitting in the middle of a big battle going on right now, for example, in one of the denominations regarding the role of women in the church, for example, I mean, uh, an issue that, in my view, should have been pretty settled a few thousand years ago, but uh, it's still going on. And I think some people think it was settled a few thousand years ago. Yeah. But it's, it's um, again, more about people's uh, personal psychology, their fears, their complexes, what's familiar, what's unfamiliar, than it is, a, I think, an honest exploration of um, you know, whatever the mysteries may be. It's it's interesting that you're. I want to kind of work this out with you a little bit. I was I was doing some research on an interview that I had with Richard Rohr a while back, and he said a comment to uh, on an interview that he was doing that a um, it's an hour by hour process of gratitude that can free liberate one from the um, temptation to resentment. And he he then defined gratitude from the original gratis in Latin and uh, kind of undeserving. And I've said this a lot, so pardon me, listener and viewer, but I think it's so important that there's this set point of our ego which seeks to uh, preserve its autonomy and thereby project its autonomy out onto the world as if it is the world. And so the would you would you talk about your understanding of the relationship to this resistance that you're talking about, the ways in which the psyche or the ego in particular resists any kind of disruption to its perceptions and views? Sure. Well, in the first three chapters of The Broken Mirror, as you know, I talk about these internal uh, difficulties. That we stand in the way of our own opening to growth and development. Um, and, and the first chapter, the three attitudes that all of us have to some degree. First of all, is a certain amount of skepticism. I, you're talking about me? You want me to do what? I mean, the magnitude of the project just sounds uh, too much, mm. uh, which is it leads to the second one, which is intimidation. It's, you know, I, I'm not up for this challenge. And, and third, frankly, is laziness or lassitude. That uh, skepticism and, and lassitude and intimidation are attitudes we all have to some degree when we confront that which is going to reconfigure, reframe our understanding of self and world. Secondly, we're, create, we're creatures of adaptation, and necessarily so, because we're, we're born tiny, powerless, and dependent on whatever environment uh, life has thrown us into. And the greater your adaptation, the likelihood of the greater the internal discrepancy and, and association with your natural organic self. And thirdly, we're creatures that stories our experience. I'm making a noun here, a verb. This part of our effort to make sense of it. What, what was that all about? And so, for example, if you and I sitting at this remove say, now, why would a child be scarred by poverty or disease or alcoholism or, or abuse? And, and the answer is actually very clear, not logical, but clear. And that is every infant believes at some level and every child that what's happening to me is somehow a statement to me about me and about the nature of the world. So a message overlearned there about adaptation becomes an internalized story and then gets transferred to other life circumstances. Move that person into the field of intimate relationship, move that person into the field of engaging with collective structures such as you know, society or, or the, the church itself or whatever. And they're going to be carrying that general orientation that was set in motion back back in childhood, not understand that, and they'll be in service to that story. So these are all internal obstacles that we acquire along the way. I think inevitably acquire, acquire but ultimately stand in the way of our opening to the radical otherness of the unconscious. Because in the long run, the unconscious is unconscious, and we can't say much about it. But we can deepen our conversation around what that means and watch for the clues that come up, clues that show up in the feeling function, that in, show up in our energy system. When you're doing what's right for you, the energy's there. 
when it's not right for you, you have to constantly mobilize it. Uh, indications that come up by way of your dreams, which will comment on, on the conduct of your life. And of course, most important of all is that elusive but central question of meaning. If what you're doing is meaningful, you will feel the support from within. And if you're, if it's not ultimately meaningful, as seen by the psyche, then there will be an exhaustion, burnout, internal discord, and self-sabotage that uh, you see all around you mo much of the time. Uh, a good example, I was just flashing as I was talking there about someone who's now deceased in Houston, who used to focus in particular on creative individuals in the arts and elsewhere who were experiencing creative blocks. And, and that person specialized in working with uh, talented individuals who felt blocked in, in their ability to do whatever their art form was and so forth. And, and that person could draw from her own experience in a way that uh, allowed her to appropriate what she learned to serve someone else's experience. Now, again, what was important in that process was, was not someone fixing the problem, but helping mm -hmm. reframe our understanding of the problem. And when we do that, then, then we realize a, a certain amount of accountability comes back to each one of us. Because I think all of us would say, no matter what's happened, at the end of the journey, we're accountable for our choices and our basic behaviors. You can't say you didn't choose that person to marry, or you can't say you didn't choose that, that lifestyle that you're talking about. You can't say that you chose to avoid this opening in your life, et cetera. Those are part of the accountability for an individual. And of course, a person can be overwhelmed by that and, and feel shamed by that or, or invalidated by that. But, you know, sooner or later, your question is you have to pull up your socks and then decide what is what's important to you. Now, in my own situation here at this moment, there are certain things I can't do because of continuing uh, healing process, such as significant travel. I miss that enormously. Um, I also have to ration my my energy for some obvious reason. So there are limits to deal with. But then the question is, those are limits to be respected, but not the limits that we impose on ourselves. That say, well, I'm old, too old to do this or that. The real question is, what what matters to you? What what is interesting to you? What is it that causes you to wake up and examine something and re, re rethink something or refeel something for yourself? Therein is where you will find your, your spirit wishing you to be engaged with your life. And it will shift and evolve as you do, but, but lose contact with that. And, and you've lost contact really with the deep source of uh, guidance in your life. So what do you say like when you're working in analysis? What do you say to somebody who touches that and they feel a great deal of shame? and they want to withdraw well i i i think you know first of all shame comes from two basic areas uh one is that we feel we didn't measure up to some level of expectation whether that was realistic or or compassionate or not is a different matter we just feel we didn't measure up and secondly people are often shamed again by the circumstances of their lives and um th that's uh if understandable but fallacious process that needs to be challenged because you are not what happened around you, right? You're not responsible for that abuse. You're not responsible for this and that, but we, we are responsible for our behaviors as a result of that. That's, that's a different uh, point of, of reference. So again, in looking at this conversation, the, the deepened conversation is always asking the question, now, what is the task that I need to address at this point in my journey? And that's going to evolve. That's going to change. And when we track that, we will we will feel the usefulness of those changes rather than fight them. Um, again, remember the word therapy simply means to listen to or pay attention to. And what is it you're paying attention to? Psyche, the soul. For the word psychotherapy, you don't have to go see a therapist to be psychotherapeutic with yourself. You pay attention. Where is that coming from in me? Where have I been? Where have I been here before? Who am I apart from the roles I play of, of this set of choices that I have to make? Which path enlarges me with which path diminishes me? Uh, questions like that 
which are well within our capacity, begin to shift the frame away from the problematic out there and bring it back home in a way to say, but so much of this in me is attitudinal in character. So much of this is the contentions of my history and who I am and where I am at this point allows me to understand that in a different way and gives me a greater uh, range of choices than I would have had, let's say, as a child and so forth. So as, as Jung said, we, we don't really solve our life problems, but we can outgrow some of them. And some of them will remain problems uh, all of our lives. And, and you just you don't get to choose that. That's, that's something that's chosen by fate or the gods or whatever. And, and yet you have to, in some way, wrestle with that. And Jung gave us a personal example, coming from an extended family of clerics. I think there was something like six, including his uncles and father. And he said, all of them failed to address the condition of the spirit in their time. He said they were content simply to follow the forms. And he said that left for me unfinished business, a project I had to carry forward. It wasn't necessarily his choice. It was something that uh, life was presenting him. And so he spent uh, so much. I, I remember when we were looking at the first volume in the um, se seminars that we were having in uh, Houston, uh, John, mm -hmm. The uh, Symbols of Transformation was our first book that we read. And I said, you notice how much Jung here is talking about the modern spirit. Now, this is, again, in 1912 is when it's published. But he's talking about the modern spiritual tradition. Why is he talking about that? And, and of course, the individual whom he's examining in the course of that work is a person who is carrying something of, of that struggle and conflict. Uh, intrapsychically, and it shows up in her uh, productions, her active imaginations that he then proceeds to analyze. So again, we're we're not exempt from what's happening around us in our popular culture. We're we're influenced by it as well. There are cultural complexes as well as there are personal complexes. But again, each of us has a different journey and a different pathway. And each of us has an invitation with ourselves, and not everybody shows up for the invitation, I, I suspect. Yeah. Well, it brings up this, as you're talking about this, and as I read your work, I, I can't help but feel um, underserved by the religion of my upbringing and the necessity to have a worldview that supports the inevitabilities of what we're talking about here. I mean, the the suffering and the struggles and the illusion that there are ways to avoid this summons to essentially, I, I think at its core, confront our impending death. And so I, 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 I want you to help me here because if I'm teaching a class, I'll tend to comment on some of the sickness of our culture that are collective stories don't serve the broadening and expanding of our relationship to the nature of reality. Could you comment on that? I mean, would you align with that? And then if so, what is sick in our cultural lens and how can we, how can we try to work with that in a more um, expansive way? Well, two, two basic thoughts here. None of them, neither of them is original, of course. One is that in every institution, you have to ask this base, basic question. And by the way, marriage is an institution. Remember Groucho Marx saying, it, it's a great institution, but I don't want to be institutionalized, right? Well, the question is, does that person grow and develop in that marital relationship, or are they blocked and inhibited? And you don't always know from outside. You have to really look at that from within to, to address that question. The same would be true of any other institution. Does this institution open people to the life of the spirit? Does it give them freedom of choice? Um, so often what you find in certain organizations is they're very worried about some of the choices you might make. And therefore there's an enormous effort to control people's behaviors and values and, and so forth. And through uh, corporate guilting, uh, make a person feel very, very intimidated if, if they step out of line there. So. You know, there are a lot of folks who are recovering from that tradition 
uh, unfortunately, and, and are suffering enormously because it's violated their soul. That's what happened. Those are spiritual mm -hmm. crimes. Um, and at the same time, you see that the pr process of taking this on and if need be, leaving your own tradition in order to find another one is never going to be easy. It's always going to be a, a, an experience of exile. One of the things I've found in speaking around the country and elsewhere um, for really a half century now is in a large number of people, although minuscule in relationship to collective society, that have been estranged and felt there was something not healthy in their relationship to their culture or their own history, but felt intimidated by numbers. And, you know, I must be wrong because I'm, I'm outnumbered. I'm mm -hmm. outvoted. I remember thinking as a child, some certain things don't make sense to me, but I'm a kid. What do I know? You know, when I get to be an adult, they, they'll, I'll understand the way they do. Well, I, I became an adult and then realized I didn't have much understanding of anything. Yeah. But that that the complexes it had to do with fitting in and belonging and the fear of confrontation and, and exile were such that kept people, you know, caught in very unhealthy situations. So somewhere along the line, one has to say, whose life is this anyhow? And if I'm not living my life, whose life am I living? And why am I here? This is not about narcissism. It's not about self-absorption. This is a humbling process. It's at times a frightening process. And at the same time, the rightness of it becomes clear as you begin to take steps that are legitimate for you. Because again, something inside of you supports you just as it opposes you when you're off track. I, I've, I've been fond, as you know, of, of an epigram from uh, Emily Dickinson from 1863, where she said, the sailor cannot see the north, but knows the needle can. It was her way of talking about the diminution of institutional uh, importance in her life in the town in which she lived, uh, you know, in New England, and um, the importance of an inner compass. Do you know you have an inner compass? And do, do you trust it? And do you carry it with you in a conscious way where, where you travel? And if you do, you will find true north for you. And that'll allow you to make certain choices that, that are right for you. If you don't, you're going to be listening to the loudest voice in your culture or you know, trying to earn enough money to buy the latest shiny thing in your culture. Either way, you're going to be pulled away from your path because you've lost contact and, and you are adrift uh, in that dark wood that we all enter at some point in our journey. Yeah, you say on page 160 that the gods are not felt, when they're not felt as presences, we project our need for them onto objects. Yeah, Can you... of which, for example, consumerism and, and the diversions of popular culture are the places where most people are plugged in today. Um, you know, try to t take people's uh, cell phones away from the teenagers, see what happens. <laughs> or, or, or people pull people away from the Internet. And, yeah. you know, you, you will see uh, all of the marks of, of addiction. Of addiction. And, yeah. and all addictions are anxiety management systems because they're designed to lower the level of stress that one is feeling at the time. Well, the problem is, of, like any addiction, the stress doesn't go away, it, it, it abides, and your treatment plan comes to own you. You, you, you become, um, you know, the inhabitant of, of the cell in which that treatment plan is, is being exercised constantly. I had a client in Houston years ago who was a member of AA and said a wonderful uh, saying from his group that I, I thought was so applicable to everyone. He said, they frequently say, this isn't working for me but I do it very well. Mm. I thought that's a great way of putting, you say it to anybody, this isn't working for me because something inside of me knows better, but I do very well because I, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been doing it for decades, so I'm pretty practiced at it. Um, but inside something always knows and something is protesting. And, you know, that's the life of the, the spirit, which I think never quite flickers out, although it can be in peril, that's for sure. There, there is something about um, maybe we can complete this cycle that 
what does a, I, I dare use the phrase successful, but what does a healthy healing analysis uh, beget? You know, what, what would you consider a healthy or healing analytic experience for somebody? Well, I would say the same would be applicable of affiliation with a group. I, I wasn't in any way against group behavior. I think it's, an, it's a natural thing to group with people of common intentionality. I'm simply saying that, again, the proof's in the pudding. Does that practice or that group serve as a platform for people if they need to, to leave freely and, and also to find their individual journey? Does it help them grow and enlarge as human beings, including in their capacity for relationships? So again, we're not talking about isolation here, but uh, if, if these things don't apply, then, then you have a problem. The same is true of a person who's in uh, some long-term therapy. The, the, the question is, it's not that you get on top of the complexes, you just become more aware of the presence. You know more the other play, players on the playing field when you, you make a decision. You might even be able to say, I have a tendency in circumstances like this to do X and Y. So that's very helpful to know because if you don't know that, you're already going to be a prisoner of that reflexive response. Because much of life is a set of reflexive responses designed to manage our anxiety, get our needs met as best we can. Mm -hmm. And that's part of our skill of the organism to, to be adaptive as it is. At the same time, <laughs> again, the greater the adaptation, the more likely I'm separating from something that matters deep, deeply within. And so, you know, fitting in is understandable. But what's the price of fitting in? Fear is normal, human, and natural, but a fear-based and fear-driven life is, is not a pretty thing to witness. So again, we have to be able to make those kinds of distinctions because the ego often gets caught in these either-or fallacies. It's like, I'm either going to do this or I'm going to do that, when in fact, the, the truth requires the holding of some tensions of opposites in all of us from time to time. You know, I, I just, very specifically, I am on a daily basis asking myself, what can I do in terms of physiology and what is my medical condition limit me from doing? Um, what do I do with my precious time that is shrinking? Um, and and what's the best way not to waste my energy doing things I don't want to do, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that, that's in the context, that's in a particular context. It, it, it's about being mindful of the limitations and structures in which we find ourselves. And at the same time to say, and, and what is the task for me in this situation? What is the path I am to follow in this situation? And can I mobilize the resources, the courage, and the consistency to live that in, in the immediate future? And if I do, in some way, then you're living your life as opposed to living out somebody else's unfinished business. But you mentioned structures and something you've talked about often, which is great to hear from with your perspective, that the structures of gender right now in our culture are really wildly fluid. I mean, much more fluid than they've ever been in modernity, at least. And I'm wondering sure. from your lens what you're seeing regarding these uh, more gender fluid dynamics. And I find myself, when I when I lead lectures, I, I have to give some kind of disclaimer when I say a word like masculine or feminine and, you know, make make notable distinctions between sex and gender. And would you comment on that, what you see in our sure, culture? Sure, sure. Uh, for, for my parents, their social life was governed by belief in certain structures. And those structures were believed to come either from nature itself or from divinity directly. Those structures included issues like gender definitions and what, what were the do's and don'ts of gender and what was the bill of particulars that come with that. Racial categories was another one. A socioeconomic categories was still another one. Uh, issues of ethnicity, of course, lifestyle and other choices. So for, for my parents' world, these were fixed. They, they're what we might call fixities, a word I've invented that's in bad English, but you get the idea. These are fixities in life, and you better fit in the fixities because if you don't, there's going to be an enormous price there. And I grew up in that world, and yet, you know, 
along the way, along life's journey, not to mention changes in the society, also known as the 60s, there was an enormous uh, upheaval of protest, if you will, and critical scrutiny of those fixities. Um, and, and to realize that what we thought or what, what has been thought as fixed by nature or divinity is in fact a human social construct. And human constructs are far more uh, flexible than we think they are. So, you know, you can't even say what is a white person today. You can't even say what is a black person today. You might talk about the black experience, for example, the experience of being brown in America or something like that. But there's no such thing as, as the experience of that person. You have to talk to each individual to see the way in which he or she experiences their life in this particular culture. Change is usually not welcomed by the by the ego, and therefore there's an enormous amount of backlash, as we know. The regressive part, I would say a good 40% of our country wants to go back to the good old days. Well, yeah. the good old days weren't good. That's the thing you need to know. There was rampant discrimination against women. There was discrimination against all minorities. And the minorities have rightly gotten pretty tired of that and have spoken out. Um, and And... For so many people, their lives were governed by the collective values. The good news is you can wake up in the morning and know what your marching orders are for the day. The bad news is your marching orders may take you further and further and further from your own soul and what you're supposed to do with your life. That's a huge price to pay. Mm -hmm. So the, the conflict we're experiencing in our culture right now has to do with change, and especially the rapidity of change. For a lot of people, this has happened overnight. It hasn't. It's been happening for centuries. It's just that it's reached a level. It's kind of like the pot that is finally boiling. And out of that is a, a ultimately a profound invitation to reconfigure all of these categories and to say, what does it mean to be in this particular um, definition? And is that supportive and liberating? Or is it oppressive? Mm -hmm. And if it's oppressive, then of course it has to be challenged. And that's what's happened. You know, the women's movement of the 60s was a, was a good example of that. It has produced substantial changes. I'm just uh, being, um, this morning I had a, a notification from a former graduate school of mine, the new president's a woman, and that's marvelous. You know, when, when I was young, it, the odds of a woman being president of a university were very slim because of rather few women in the higher ranks of academia. And that's changed for the better. And so as a result, what we've, what we've experienced is sort of the opening up of the human possibility rather than, be, than being defined by basically fears. If I put it in the bluntest possible way I can, I'm, I'm very upset of having to be dictated to by other people's fears. I, I wish they would pay attention to their fears and address them themselves because, you know, what's what's going, what's so threatening to you? Um, ask yourself, what's so threatening? What is it you're hanging on to that, that you feel, it, you know, letting go of it imperils your life? It won't. It, it's merely an attachment you've had that has become familiar to you. It's ultimately um, binding to you and constricting. And that's not good for you. It's not good for other people. So uh, face your fears, grow up, and allow people to be whoever they are. And when you do, uh, it'll be a much more congenial society. And you'll find your place in it uh, as a kind of ongoing invitation that right now you don't have because you're still being captivated by, by the definitions of those uh, structures. Oh, Jim, I got to say thank you. I know we need to finish, but I, I'm when you say face your fears and grow up, I feel a great sense of empowerment. And I, I feel that call to strengthen myself and encounter what comes my way. Thank you for being a beacon of knowledge and wisdom for everybody who connects with your work. But certainly as a very meaningful guide and teacher for me, I'm forever grateful to you. John, it's been a pleasure to be with you, and I wish you well. Thank you. You too, Jim. See you next Thank time. Thank you. Take care. Peace. You too. Shalom. Peace be to you. Shalom. Bye-bye, <laughs> John.
this way